very warm welcome uh, uh, to all of you uh, taking part in this session. Um, yeah, my name is Roland Kulpke. I'm working for Transform Europe, which is uh, the political think tank of the European Left Party. Uh, as Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is a member uh, of our network, uh, so uh, Alexander was kind to invite me. Uh, I'm extremely glad uh, to be here with you because um, we are here uh, for book launch uh, of the latest book of uh, Deborah James. Uh, I've waited for this book a long time, I can promise you. Um, uh, Deborah is very well known, uh, honestly, worldwide, uh, because uh, Deborah uh, is uh, not only the director of international programs at the Center of Economic and Policy Research, I think, think I have come across a long time ago, but especially from my, from my point of view, uh, Deborah is single-handedly organizing uh, the Our World is Not for Sale network, and hence has a tremendous impact uh, and incredible knowledge uh, on the international trade sphere. Um, Deborah will start uh, our uh, debate today, um, but uh, Deborah uh, will not be the only speaker. Um, after Deborah uh, Kamati, Caroline Mugala uh, will uh, take over for five to eight minutes. Um, she, uh, Kamati is uh, the executive secretary of the East African Trade Union Confederation. So basically the sister organization of the EPUC, uh, also based here in Brussels. Um, Afterwards, uh, Rashmi Banga, Senior Economic Affairs Officer with the Division on Globalization and Development Strategies in UNCTAD, will take over. I might uh, say that this division is basically uh, the most important part in my understanding inside uh, the whole United Nations organization. So uh, thanks a lot uh, already now for being here uh, with us, Rashmi. Uh, last not least, um, Kate. Lepin uh, will uh, take the floor. Uh, she's uh, the Regional Secretary Asia and Pacific for the uh, Public Services International uh, Trade Union. Um, and um, they promised uh, to finish uh, also uh, our discussion with taking up uh, the judgment of today, which came out uh, from the European Court uh, on the Apple uh, decision, uh, but we'll take up this later. Um, just one more information. Uh, I would be very glad if you let us know who you are. Um, please also write down if you have questions. What we'll do is Deborah will now open uh, with uh, 15, 20 minutes, uh, presenting her book, which you can download for free and which you can also order already now uh, with the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung office in Brussels. Afterwards, uh, please just a few technical questions. So not political discussion, we will come to this later, I promise you. And we will then have the other three short interventions, also always with short technical questions of understanding and we will have a general debate afterwards. Okay, so, so far from my side, thanks for being here, uh, Deborah, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung uh, for publishing the paper and for organizing this seminar. And to Roland and to all of my excellent co-panelists, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, just to say, Our World is Not for Sale is a global network of about 250 groups from the global north and south, from about 50 different countries. And we oppose the current model of corporate globalization and we work together for a democratic sustainable and fair multilateral uh, trading system. So today, uh, I'm going to share with you three major points. We're here to talk about the digital trade rules that the big tech corporations are pushing in the WTO and in other forums. So I'm gonna talk about the origin of the talks. Why are we having this discussion? I'll give you a brief status update, and then I'm gonna focus on the implication of the rules. So a uh, couple of basic points technology obviously can stimulate prosperity and development it can bring us closer together and help build sustainable livelihoods we are not anti-technology but it can also constrain development it can exacerbate inequalities and it can destroy jobs and ways of life so whether countries 
workers and consumers everywhere will benefit from new technology or whether the benefits will only accrue to a teeny tiny minority will be determined by the rules which set the playing field for how digitalization will evolve over time. And the important point is who is setting those rules? Now, one of the best investments that corporations can make is to change the rules under which they operate so that they can extract greater profits from the economy while preventing their competitors from having a level playing field. Now, powerful corporations have long used their surplus profits to invest in the undemocratic practice of trade policymaking, to use trade agreements to lock in rules promoting their rights to make profits while limiting government's ability to regulate them in the public interest, often through policies that they could not have advanced through democratic channels. The World Trade Organization, as we know, is the uh, global uh, rulemaking body on international trade. Uh, and big tech and other corporations operating in transport, logistics, telecoms, finance, agribusiness, industrial, many other sectors, are lobbying governments to use the WTO to liberalize the digitalization that is currently transforming the global economy. And particularly the governance of today's most valuable resource, which is data. Now, many would agree that new operations are urgent. These would include, for example, uh, new antitrust rules that would promote fair competition across digitally affected sectors. It would include new tax rules to ensure that tech corporations begin to pay their fair share. It would include new labor rules to address the exploitation of employees as contractors. New fairness rules to ensure that proponents of artificial intelligence are not exacerbating discrimination and bias. And new rules governing privacy and security. However, what corporations are seeking by using trade treaties is actually the opposite of the type of rules that we need. So trade agreements give rights to expand trade. These rights are exercised by corporations. That's who trades but they place no additional responsibilities on corporations. So at the same time, these rules discipline national regulation of corporations. They literally place handcuffs on legislative and regulatory bodies, which are exercising their democratic rights to regulate foreign corporations operating on domestic soil. So far from accomplishing the widely popular reforms of the tech sector, which are urgently needed, trade rules uh, inherently give corporations more rights and inherently place limits on public regulation that should be expanded in this sector. And that is a, a point that is rarely discussed when we discuss the pros and cons of trade agreements. So in reality, big tech has proposed the rules in order to consolidate its exploitative business model. And I find this the clearest way of explaining what people sometimes think are like technical aspects of the rules, because you all know their business model. So what does it include? It includes gaining rights to access markets globally. They want to be around the world. They want to lock in deregulation and they want to evade and prevent future regulation. They want to access an unlimited supply of cheap labor that has been stripped of its rights. They want to expand their power through monopolies. They want to avoid payment of taxes. And now the newest aspect they want to be able to extract and control personal, social, and business data around the world. Data is the lifeblood of the digital economy. So whichever firms dominate artificial intelligence in their sectors by virtue of their big data set will dominate their industries. Artificial intelligence depends on the massively large sets of big data to train the machines learning to make the decisions. Think about the fact that US-based Big tech, transnational corporations, Google, Apple, Facebook, uh, Amazon, and Microsoft are now five of the six largest corporations in the world, okay? Their valuation in terms of market capitalization is so high because they are data collectors and investors know the value of the data for future profits. So even corporations that have failed to turn a profit they can still garner venture capital if their business model appears to put them in a position to collect data in a way that sets them up to dominate their industry. That's why having rules on digitalization or digital trade or e-commerce is not the same 
as having binding global rules on the entire digital economy written by big tech for its own benefit. These are not e-commerce rules. They go far beyond e-commerce and would result in the liberalization of all aspects of the economy. They really represent a new constitution for the digital economy of the future. Now, ensuring that technology is deployed to serve the well-being of humanity and the planet and shared prosperity. This is what we want. We want technology for good. Now, this will only be possible if we exercise our democratic rights and prevent big tech from rigging the rules of the future global economy to increase their own profit and control. So what's a quick status update? Well, in 2016, the Obama administration first proposed rules on digital trade in the WTO after hiring a corporate tech lobbyist under the guise of e-commerce talks in the WTO. We in our world is not for sale had seen these rules in the trade and services agreement, the uh, TISA, which we were successful in derailing together with Public Services International just before Trump's inauguration, okay? Now these rules were already in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, although the text at the time wasn't, wasn't public. So it's in the TPP. They also currently exist in the EU, uh, Japan uh, FTA, and the US-Japan FTA, and in the renegotiated NAFTA, the so-called US-Mexico-Canada agreement, okay? So those are the uh, agreements where it already exists. Now in the WTO, after the US introduced in 2016, proponents tried to get all 164 members to agree to a new mandate, to negotiate binding rules on digital trade, and to permanently push aside the development agenda, which has been pending since 1995, okay? But developing countries resisted the imposition of this new corporate agenda, and they blocked the new mandate at the last WTO ministerial, which was in Buenos Aires in December 2017. However, a group of 76 countries launched talks among themselves to bring about a binding agreement on digital trade in the WTO. Now, these nations are constantly lobbying and pressuring other developing countries that are not participating also to join their ranks. Their aim is to conclude an agreement involving as many countries as possible, as well as to secure a mandate for talks among members of the WTO, all the members, by the time of the next ministerial conference. So that was supposed to occur last month, um, but it's been postponed at this time, as you know. So let's talk about what are some of the uh, implications of the rules um, for working people, okay? Now, one of the characteristics of the contemporary global economy is that while the productivity of workers and small businesses has increased over time, obviously, large corporations continually take more and more than their share. Because, as I mentioned, they have used their surplus profits to intervene in the policymaking process to design the market to distribute more of the gains to themselves. Now, this process has been facilitated by digitalization, and the proposed rules are intended to lock in and accelerate that appropriation of the productivity of workers. So the proposed digital trade rules, as we know, they were written by big tech corporate lawyers to further entrench rules to maximize their profits and power. Now, these proponents of the rules are some of the worst violators of labor rights in the world, and they should not be the ones writing a new constitution for the digital economy, okay? The digital trade rules are intended to decimate decent jobs and increase the precarity of labor because that's part of their business model. The most important goal for big tech and the digital trade negotiations is to gain rights to cross-border data flows, or what they often call free flow of information or free flow of data. But it's not free. It's the corporatization and privatization of the data, claiming a property right by the harvester or miner of the data over and above the rights of the producer of the data or the community from whence the data comes. They want to ban governments from being able to regulate cross-border data transfers. Now, at this point, most people don't properly grasp the value of data, meaning that individuals and governments are too easily allowing it to be collected and indiscriminately and transferred outside their countries by transnational corporations. Now, data is the primary resource of the future global economy, and people and governments are increasingly calling for this resource to be utilized for the public good. Now, the only way 
to bring about a rebalancing of power globally, away from capital and giant corporations and the extremely rich towards people who work, is to promote state and workers and community ownership of society's most important resources. And that includes data. So proposals within the WTO to give big tech the right to collect, hoard, store, transfer across borders, sell, and control the use of data, to ban countries from being able to require even a copy of uh, data to be stored domestically, or to use local servers in the storage of the data. These would severely constrain the ability to ensure that working people can harness the benefits of digitalization. And workers in industry and in transport and health education, even in agriculture, okay, I have more details in the book, each of these sectors will be affected. Public sector workers will be especially affected uh, because of the increase in privatization that Kate is gonna discuss. The proposals also fail to address specific issues for workers of platformization, including the right to organize. And in fact, they include no proposals or demands from labor. The proposed bans on government's ability to require the disclosure of source code, which is what feeds AI, would make regulating digital bias at work more difficult, okay? Ban in fact, banning mandatory source code disclosure is really a brazen attempt by big tech to evade future legal accountability for discrimination and bias under the guise of protecting intellectual property. Okay. Proposed bans on the regulation of cross data transfer would constri severely constrain workers' privacy over their own data. And the proposals would entrench gender inequalities, but proponents are using pinkwashing, saying it's great for women entrepreneurs, okay? So we have a section on that. My colleague Kamati Mugala from the East African Trade Union Confederation will discuss more of these issues, so I'm gonna leave it there uh, for now. Now, digitalization, these rules are also, also a huge disaster for development, okay? Digital liberalization will likely facilitate more imports of products and services with a high digital content into, rather than exports from developing countries. Now, the proponents are disguising their proposals in the Trojan horse of being able to unleash development through the power of micro, small, and medium enterprises using e-commerce. But if digital trade is expanded, liberalized, without first improving the productive capacities in developing countries, developing countries will simply be opening up their economies to even more imports, which will destroy jobs and informalize them and decimate MSMEs. The digital divide is being narrowed, that's good news, but the economic digital divide is actually growing and the network effects will continue to exacerbate it unless countries engage in smart digitalization. Now the rules also include a proposed ban on government's ability to require technology transfer. This would very much harm and hamper digitalization in developing countries. Now developing countries have proposed many, many pro-development strategies historically in the WTO and other trade agreements, but that agenda is being pushed aside in favor of the corporate digital agenda that's only interesting for a few countries. And there's a lot more analysis of the potential implications of digital trade for development in the paper. I don't have time to go through, but my colleague Rashmi is gonna elaborate some of these points in her presentation. Now there's also some more issues. If concluded, the rules would mandate the com that commercial interests trump privacy and data protection. Okay, so digital rules in the WTO, they are a fundamental threat to our personal privacy and data protection. The rules would give corporations virtually unlimited rights to transfer data to whatever jurisdiction they please in data havens and would prioritize commercial rights over consumer protections and citizens' rights to privacy in ways that cannot be fixed in the WTO. So digital corporations that I think have shown a complete disregard for consumer protection complete disregard for citizen privacy rights should not be trusted to self-regulate, okay? Now there's some in the WTO, some acknowledgement of the need for some data privacy protections in the digital trade talks, particularly by Europe, but the US insists that these provisions are voluntary for corporations, okay? Allowing data flows to be governed by a trade tribunal would subject fundamental rights to corporate trade interests. That's the bottom line. Now, there's a lot of really important issues for taxation. We know that avoiding taxes is part of the fundamental business model of these corporations. And, uh, you know, workers already pay a disproportionate and increasing share of the global tax burden. But the digital players are taking advantage 
of the mobility and intangibility of digital goods and services to further avoid tax obligations. So these rules would promote tax evasion and the loss of public, necessary public revenue. There are at least seven different provisions that would allow digital corporations to severely limit their tax liabilities, both reducing tariffs and structuring the economy in a way that they would avoid corporate taxes. Um, and both Kate and Rashmi are going to touch on this, so I'm going to um, leave it at there uh, at this point. But we have to consider how important tariff revenue is for uh, developing countries in particular because they are still primarily dependent on primary commodity exports. And it's, it's still really important um, to use for many other reasons. Global tax reform is a priority, even in the rich uh, countries club of uh, OECD. Uh, but the proposed digital trade rules would actually undermine these efforts. Now, the Trump administration, as I'm sure you've heard, has been criticizing countries such as France for implementing digital uh, services taxes, saying that they should wait for the global resolution through the OECD. But the US just abandoned uh, the global uh, digital uh, services tax discussions at the OECD, so that's obviously going nowhere. Just a few more points I need to wrap up. The most obvious uh, implication of the erosion of corporations' share of contributions to the tax base is the reduction of decent quality accessible public services, which are essential to a thriving and cohesive society. So public services are very much at risk um, that Kate will talk about. Now, there's just two final things I want to mention. There are two important visionary concepts that must be developed to counter this idea of the inevitability of the privatization and corporatization of data. The fact that corporations should be right rules. One of them is data as a public good. Now think, instead of Uber keeping the massive data it collects about how people move about cities, why couldn't towns require that the anonymized data is shared with municipal transport planners as a condition of Uber's use of the public road infrastructure for its business profits. Just one small example. Likewise, the gathering of health data during the coronavirus can lead to further privatization of health and further enrichment of uh, healthcare corporations' profits, or it can be used to resolve the pandemic. And the answer here lies in the concept of data as a public good and the need for communities who produce data to have the rights to the economic value of that data. And uh, Kate will be discussing this further. And the last concept I want to mention is just the other big, uh, big alternative concept to this corporatization is digital industrialization. So to ensure shared prosperity from digitalization, all countries must be able to formulate and implement digital industrialization policies that ensure equitable control and governance of their key resources, particularly data, similar to the policies used in previous waves of industrialization. And I have to emphasize, this is important for developing countries. It's been developed a lot as a concept for developing countries. It's really important also in developed countries, okay, that we don't just let private corporations run off with all the benefits. And so Rashmi Banga is gonna discuss some of that. She's a world expert on digital industrialization. So I will leave it to her to explain more of those issues. So um, sorry for the rushed analysis, but with I'm just opening up some of the main uh, proposed rules. I will now turn it over to my co-panelists to discuss some of the impacts as they see them for um, their communities. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Deborah. Um, I have seen no technical questions right now of understanding. Uh, if there's any uh, really question, uh, abbreviation or whatever, uh, Please let us know. Otherwise, um, I will now uh, give the floor to Kamati, uh, focusing on uh, my understanding uh, workers' workers' rights. Uh, yeah, please, wonderful. Thanks. Please start. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen. Is it is it yeah, working? Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, I can see. Okay, thank you. So my intervention will basically focus on uh, the digital trade rules uh, negotiations and how it will impact workers and workers' rights. Um, I think from, from just Deborah's analysis, it, it clearly shows that uh, there are major concerns on digital economy. And, and as Deborah said, we are not against uh, uh, digital technology, but we are looking at digi 
told technology that you know will benefit all. That's including including workers. Um, so I'm gonna just share with you um, comments from uh, from 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 the International Trade Union Organization in terms of our work around what we are seeing as 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 as, as trade unions in terms of um, how this is going to affect labor. So Deborah already mentioned the issue around rolling back uh, on decent work. Uh, or decent work deficit and increasing uh, pre pre precarious work. And this is specifically seen um, from the kind of you know, jobs that are being introduced uh, uh, digitally, the kind of jobs that we are getting. We are now getting things like self-employed agency work. And we very well know that this kind of employment uh, often, you know, reduces the workers' rights. You know, they like, you know, predictable working times. It means, you know, any time for you is work time. Issues around social protection, issues around um, fair wages, issues around organizing of, 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 the, of the platform workers. And, and we know the role that collective bargaining agreement actually plays in ensuring that it protects. Uh, uh, workers' uh, uh, rights, and, and it becomes much difficult uh, from, for, for the workers that are working digitally or what we call gig economy or platform economy. The other issue that also Deborah alluded to is uh, making enforcement of local labor laws more difficult. Uh, take an example of Uber. Uh, you have no, you know, you have you you have no physical presence <clears throat> in a particular country. So when we have issues around labor laws uh, being broken and we have to call you to book, it becomes very difficult for those who have um, industrial court or uh, you know uh, taking you to court to be answerable if you do not have. Uh, physical presence in that particular country. Um, the other thing that uh, I, I would also like to look at is the issue around, you know, the whole concept of eroding workers' rights by necessity. Uh, digital transformation, um, the digital tra transformation that society is undergoing is testing some of those, you know, hard-won uh, rights about what cons constitutes a worker and what rights and protection they deserve. And, and, and this have been you know, clearly also mentioned when I talked about uh, you know, an increase in, in, in precarious work. We have challenges to, um, uh, brought about by algorithmic and um, uh, transparency. Algorithm is good. You know, flying the plane, I think 40% of the time you're on the flight, uh, it's, it's algorithm at, at play. It's being used during, you know, st uh, stock trades. Now we are seeing a lot of innovation around self-drive vehicle. Um, so it's a good thing. But, you know, you see, when it comes to, you know, labor and workers, we are also seeing this being used in terms of making decision on who to, you know, hire. Uh, after a job interview, we were looking at in terms of enforcement, whether an offender will, you know, repeat it. We are looking at it deciding what kind of social care provisions uh, a service user needs to be given. Uh, so as we enter increasingly sensitive areas of, 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 as it enters in sensitive areas of our lives, like deciding if I, I, I get a job or I get fired, we need to have meaningful accountability. And I think um, uh, Deborah already mentioned that issues around accountability for those who create and you know, deploy this kind of uh, mechanism and decision-making system, because it's, 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 it's a system that is going to make a decision. So uh, how do we uh, account for that? And why, where is the transparency in all this? Uh, especially on decisions that have significant impact on an individual. Um, 
The other area is expanding market access right for digital. And uh, uh, this also goes hand in hand with my next point, which is increase of, of, of power uh, of big tech of our workers. Uh, there's, there's quite a revolution going on uh, within government, and um, I think some of you might know or might have heard of what we call uh, gov, uh, gov tech, that this could actually transform uh, the nature of public services and who delivers them. But when you look at some of the proposals that are being put on the table <clears throat> and the people that are actually making this kind of rules and and regulation, uh, it's, it's big tech companies that are getting into this discussion. So where does you know the small, medium uh, companies uh, 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 fall in, in terms of the decisions that are being put? And this means uh, this is increasing the power of the big tech, and particularly coming from a workers' organization in terms of our workers' uh, rights introduction of data gathering technology, its analysis and use has also been disputed and a delicate balance between a worker and employer. Uh, we, and, and that's the problem why I'm saying it's very hard for you to organize or you know, get into a collective bargaining agreement because you have to have a clear uh, employer and worker relationship where Uber is saying they are not my workers, but uh, they are earning money from these drivers. Uh, so that, that's, that, that becomes a, a big challenge. You know, we are talking about extending of, you know, surveillance beyond your working hours where your, your, your company can actually track uh, your movement and, uh, you know, get you to work hours beyond, you know, working area. The data is used to benefit the company actually. And the provision around source code threatens to allow employers to hide behind automated decision-making system, thereby reducing their accountability. This point is, is linked to uh, the previous points also. There's also, it also threat, it's, it's all, the rules are also threatening countries, domestic industries, future, by requiring a free transfer of data. I think in the, in the chat box, someone asked what it means for African continent um, where we do not have the infrastructure or we have you know, underdeveloped in infrastructure around technology, how will this uh, you know, affect it. And, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm using Uber as a, an example, but I, I think it's, it's, I don't know if it's a best bad practice example in terms of trying to, to, to take the point home. Uber is a transportation company that is currently valued at you know, billions of dollars, yet it does not own any cars or employ any employees. And it is using, as, as, as Deborah mentioned, capital and infrastructure uh, to, to make up for gathering um, and anal analyzing an immense volume of data on people, driver and how cars and how they move around the city and interact with the partners. So you can imagine an African country or a developing country that does not have you know, proper digital laws, rules and regulation to be able to monitor exactly or to hold companies like you know, Amazon, uh, Uber accountable to what they are doing in that, in that country. So for me, I think we need that policy space to put in place rules and regulation that will actually protect our working people uh, back home. There's also the, you know, a preference being given to those transnational companies, the big tech companies over ma micro and medium enterprises. As Deborah's introduction already mentioned, it's the big tech that are sitting on the table. And as we know, when you look at you know, SMEs, they account for over 45% of job employment you know, globally. And when you come you know, back home, I come from East Africa, uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises actually account for over 50, 60% 
of, 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 of jobs uh, in, in our economy and contribute you know, quite a chunk of the national income. But we are seeing that these rules are actually going to benefit more the big transnational companies and, uh, and the big tech companies um, over our small SMEs. Last but not least, I, I thought it would be important for me to also talk about agriculture and digital trade. And why am I saying agriculture and di digital trade? Um, most of the developing countries and Africa as a continent, agriculture is the backbone of the economy. And we are seeing today the, pro the, the pro uh, prospect of workless farms stopped by robots, we are seeing automation. Uh, I think we have had countries that have really fought hard uh, to, to, to prevent automation in, 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 the, in, the, in the tea uh, sector because that's a labor intensive sector. So when you bring automation, you can imagine the number of people that are going to lose their jobs. Um, and we, we already have uh, new jobs that are being brought on by, 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 by technology in agriculture, but, but at a huge cost. It means you have to have money to be able to invest in such kind of you know, you know, capital intensive uh, agriculture. So it means uh, you look at that peasant farmer and you're looking at that small scale farmer at home whose uh, primary uh, agriculture is to feed his family and to field, you know, uh, feed into the country's food system, uh, then they are put at a disadvantage in terms of, of, of losing their livelihood and, and their small income that they are, come, they are getting from, from agriculture. So I think it's, it's very important as, um, as we move forward in terms of looking at how these rules will impact agriculture, as, as, as I mentioned, um, this is also to answer the guy who asked what it means for, 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 the, for the African continent. So I think it's, it's also important for us to flag out this and see um, how that is going to affect uh, agriculture and, 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 and innovation around agriculture in Africa. And, and in developing country. So I'll just stop at that and uh, I think we'll have more discussions in the chat or when the question and answer session starts. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Kamati, thanks a lot uh, for your presentation. Uh, I have, following uh, the chat, I don't see any technical specific questions of understanding. So I would immediately give the floor now to Rashmi on industrial policy and please Rashmi stay with eight minutes. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Roland. And my compliments to Deborah for her excellent book, which brings together all the key issues in digital economy as well as highlights and analyzes the, uh, the restrictive digital rules uh, that are being negotiated and pushed uh, by the developed countries. One of the issues uh, discussed in the book is how digital, uh, digital industrialization can be adversely impacted by the digital rules, uh, commonly, commonly known as the e-commerce rules, which as Deborah has highlighted, go much beyond e-commerce rules. And uh, uh, there are more than 70 countries negotiating these rules in the joint statement initiative now. Uh, so it becomes very important uh, because these rules will make the digital divide, the existing digital divide permanent uh, if, if these rules are uh, multilateralized and if they are made, uh, if they are agreed to by the countries. So just um, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, if you look at what is the digital divide, I want to highlight that the countries have never been, have never felt the digital divide so severely as in this pandemic. Because we know that countries uh, which are digitally advanced, they will, uh, they will uh, have less impact of, uh, less economic impact of the lockdowns. They will recover faster. So this digital divide is going to contribute to the existing global inequalities in new ways. And if it is not bridged, it will accentuate the existing and accelerate the global inequalities at an, at an accelerating rate. 
Uh, next slide, please. So what uh, the digital divide will lead to is loss in existing trade competitiveness, reshoring of manufacturing and associated job losses, rising dependence on North for digital goods, services, and technologies, growing e-commerce. Now we have to also understand that e-commerce platforms are two-way platforms. So if you're connecting your SMEs to e-commerce platform, you're also exposing your domestic market access to foreign uh, sellers. So all these things will make uh, you know, will uh, will make digital divide contribute to the existing global inequalities. Now, how did this digital divide emerge? The way this digital divide emerged was that because of digital revolution, the digital content in industrial production started increasing. And developed countries or the big digital platforms were able to add digital content or much higher digital content in their, in all stages of production uh, for example, in the pre-production stage, higher use of digital services and data analytics was done, uh, like cloud computing, big data analytics. In the production stage, digital technologies were used, like robotics, 3D printing, and digital IT services. In the post-production stage, in the distributive services, again, digital content was increased by using e-commerce platform. So this is how... Uh, the digital revolution led to digitalization of industrial production. So the digital content increased in every stage of the production. And as a result, what happened was that the digital divide grew. So when Deborah says that the digital divide is narrowing, it is actually just the ICT infrastructure divide which is narrowing. But the digital content in the industrial production is increasing in developed countries and actually falling in the developing countries. Uh, and empirical evidence is if you look at the value added by computer programming in manufacturing exports. Now, I, I just want to highlight it's manufacturing export. So it really shows your export competitiveness. And what we find is that in developed countries, this value added by computer programming is rising steadily while it is actually falling in the period 2007 to 2014 in the, develop, in the developing countries. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So... Now, uh, the digital divide has become a multi-layered concept. It includes ICT infrastructure divide, digital skills divide, data divide, and digital technology divide. So we need comprehensive digital industrial policies to bridge the digital divide. So ICT infrastructure is just the first layer of digital infrastructure. To this, we have to add digital skill layer and data infrastructure. Now, data infrastructure includes your data centers, cloud computing infrastructure, and data processing so that you can extract data intelligence from your data. And then that data intelligence is used in your digital technologies, or you can use it to build more digital technology. So this is the entire pyramid, which I think Deborah has also explained in her book. This entire pyramid is what digital infrastructure is. And this pyramid explains what multi-layered concept digital uh, divide has now become. Uh, next, please. So if we, if we see what are the steps for digital industrialization that needs to be taken by developing countries, I would say four primary steps needs to be taken. First is to build ICT infrastructure. Now, this is the, the a necessary step, but not a sufficient step to bridge digital divide. Second step would be to build data infrastructure. To build data infrastructure, what you need to do is to first own your data and declare data sovereignty, which means that this data that is generated within the national boundaries should be governed under the national law. Uh, someone asked if we can give some good uh, examples. Rwanda has a data sovereignty policy. I think it's available on uh, internet. You can just type uh, Rwanda's digital, uh, the data sovereignty policy. It is a very good policy. They declare that the data should be governed under their own national law. But if you look at the e-commerce rules, they, they are talking about free flow of cross-border data. Now, if that happens, countries cannot then say that this data belongs to us and you cannot take it out of our national boundaries without our permission. You cannot do that. The second step that, the, the second thing uh, to build data infrastructure would be to build build the capacity to store your data and to process your data. For that, you need data centers and you need, you need clouds. 
uh, so that you can process your data and bring out the knowledge, information, and intelligence from your from the data. But again, e-commerce laws talk uh, rules talk about data localization policies. They do not want governments to have data localization policies, which means that the governments can never ask foreign firms to store and process the data that they collect from their country within their national boundaries. But uh, I would uh, say that the countries who have data localization policies like Indonesia, they are emerging as data hubs in the region. Uh, a lot of uh, digital platforms are shifting their data centers from Singapore to Indonesia and processing the, their data in Indonesia because Indonesia has a data localization policy. The next step would be to build digital skills and digital technologies. Now, when uh, initially when the industrialization happened, the way governments uh, build up their technology and the skills was to ask the foreign firms to have joint ventures with their domestic firms, to have technology transfer agreements so that there is some technology spillovers, some learning of the skills by the domestic firms. Now, we are not talking about digital technology transfers or building digital skills uh, or asking the digital platforms that when you enter, what is it? What domestic linkages are you going to have with our country? We are not doing that. And I think that is very important. Instead, what the rules, e-commerce rules are doing, they are saying that the governments cannot ask the foreign firms to share their source code. Source code is nothing but algorithms. They are digital technologies. So they are just going in the opposite direction. They are asking governments who can never ask foreign firms to share their digital technologies. Then how will the, digit, the developing countries bridge the digital divide, especially the technology divide or the skills divide? And the last step, which is not the last step in terms of building your digital industrialization, but what I'm going to talk about is the digital infant industry protection. We always had infant industry protection and one, uh, one of the most simple and effective policy tool in the hands of the government for doing this was tariffs. But today we have a WTO moratorium on custom duties on electronic transmission. Uh, now, how is that relevant? Because we know that data and software are used by all digital technologies, but data and software are also electronically transmitted. Now, if you ask governments not to regulate data and software, and you cannot put custom duties on import of software, that means that you can never give protection to your budding digital industry. Also, with the coming of uh, you know, digital technologies like 3D printing, a foreign firm can have a 3D printer in your country, import duty-free software, and 3D print any manufactured product that you are, you are manufacturing in your country. It could be footwear, it could be clothes, it can be anything. That means all your negotiated tariffs with respect to your clothes, your footwear, or whatever you have negotiated in GATT becomes irrelevant. Whatever flexibilities you have in your GATTs again become irrelevant because let's say you, you have not taken any commitments in the construction sector and you don't want construction services to come in but here you have a foreign firm coming with a 3d printer printer and building a whole house 3d printing a whole house how do you stop that so next slide please so it becomes very important for developing countries to think about their digital industrialization design digital industrial policies for building digital infrastructure and bridging the growing digital divide. Digital divide is not just ICT infrastructure divide, it is data divide, it is skill divide, and it is digital technology divide. And it is also important to retain policy space to do that in all trade agreements, whether it is multilateral, whether it is plurilateral or regional or bilateral. But in terms of, you know, what, what can the small countries do, especially in Africa, if they do not have the capacity to process and store their own data, uh, we have an UNCTAD publication on South-South Regional Digital Cooperation. It is very important for Africa to look at it because this uh, suggests a very progressive digital cooperation agenda which can help regional integration and which can provide regional support to small countries uh, so that the concept over here is that in a regional, let's say in a REC, let's say EAC or COMESA, all member countries declare uh, data sovereignty that they have right over their data. 
but they agree to share their data within the region. And then they can talk about and they can pull in their financial and human resources to have uh, data centers, clouds to process their own data, to have their regional e-commerce platforms, regional payment systems, so that all the SMEs within that region are able to benefit from the data intelligence, which is extracted from their own data. So next slide, please. So uh, I would like to uh, conclude here. And in the next slide, I have the links of all the papers that I have drawn uh, from. And uh, again, thank you, Deborah. Uh, you've covered all these issues very well in the book. And I would suggest, I think it is a must read for all the policymakers. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Varshvi. Uh, I just want to add, as my, from my position as a European, I would like uh, to uh, have uh, our industrial ministers listen to this. Uh, because we have exactly the same uh, problem. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot. Uh, definitely uh, uh, cool. Uh, yeah, so now, Kate, uh, it's your floor, please. Um, please. Thanks very much, Roland, and uh, thanks to Deborah and um, also to Rosa Luxemburg for inviting me. Um, I do have a presentation and the, the, the system is telling me that the host must allow me to uh, screen share. But so if you could give me that and I'll just start to introduce it. Um, so let me just introduce first PSI. I think I can see many people on, the, on this webinar that are familiar with PSI, but we are the global union to, that represents workers who deliver public services, whether they be um, public workers employed by the government or um, those in the private sector who should be uh, employed by the government. And we've been involved with trade campaigning for many years now uh, for a number of reasons because trade rules, I think it's been very well explained, are rules that have been established for the, in the interests of global corporations rather than workers, but also because they, those trade rules have a significant impact on public services. And so PSI is um, a global union that is committed both to protecting the rights of workers, but also to uh, um, advancing quality public services for all. Um, and in terms of the digital trade rules, well, I think it's particularly clear that this is an additional effort to ensure that public services become part of the private sector's cash cow and restrict policy making that um, could, re could redistribute both access to, to the wealth that they're monopolising, but also to major um, public goods like knowledge or data. And, um, as I think you've probably, many people have heard data being described as the new oil in that, of course, it is the most profitable resource. But in many ways, I think data is more than the new oil because, of course, oil, it's great if we can have that in the public hands and we can all then benefit from it, which hasn't been the case in, in most countries. And it's kind of a good model to show that countries that have been able to keep that resource in public hands have then been able to have the revenue required for, to build their quality public services. But it is more than that because data, of course, is not just a revenue source. It's, it's, it's uh, fundamental to everything that we do, whether it be digital data or whether it be other forms of data for proper public service planning. And right now, of course, we can all see that um, health, the need for, for, for uh, public data on health is, is more evident than ever. And for that data to not to be monopolised, for it to be shared across countries, is going to be um, key to responding to the pandemic. But all sorts of other health data in order to, to deliver public health services is required. And when that gets monopolised, of course, it skews both the responses, all sorts of public health planning. Um, but all data is required across every public service, whether it be how we use our energy, where should we locate that energy, that energy, for example, that we very much need in planning for climate, 
Uh, we need it. We need it to look at issues around how climate is changing and where, and planning. We need it for um, for building infrastructure, planning infrastructure for looking at demographics and so forth. Uh, clearly, it's needed for security. All our security, um, you know, whether that be in public public services in security or cross border security. We've seen issues of the way that data has been used in, in the delivery of social protection, whether that be um, collecting people's data and just distributing then social welfare and the, and the challenges that that's, that's happened when that's held by the private sector. And of course, in tax itself, in addition to the issues that I'll cover in a moment about uh, the tax avoidance of these big, big tech companies, we need data. We need data for tax, and that's part of our biggest problem is that um, a lot of tax information is hidden. And I think it's been mentioned as well, of course, that data is key to democracy. Sorry, I think my screen is. Oh, but let me keep going. Um, the. Not sure if I've lost control of my <laughs> screen or if uh, something's happening to wrap up. Let me try and continue. So, with all of those uh, that are clear that we obviously need that data, what happens when when uh, big corporations get hold of our data? We've seen an, across a number of most recently across a number of countries. So, um, the big tech companies are in all these. Fields. We might think of them as purely uh, delivering tech services on the internet or phones. We might think of the way that they provide cloud services. But in fact, increasingly, the big tech companies' main revenue source is often in uh, public procurement or contracts with governments. Um, Microsoft, for example, has uh, more than has had more than three thousand contracts just in security with governments, uh, security and law enforcement. It has the largest contract ever for uh, US uh, security, which has um, been $10 billion. But, uh, a number of governments are almost outsourcing their entire municipal government in, through the Smart Cities program. So, um, so I'm, Smart cities are cities that are often planned with big tech companies and every element of the city is, is designed to collect data. And that data is said to be helpful in, in uh, planning, but often it's actually about, it's a, it's a method for data mining that's held then in the hands of private corporations. And a lot of these example, these sample smart cities are almost without governance, without uh, public sector governance. In India, there's been a commitment to try and produce 100 smart cities. And these smart cities can be seen with, you know, towering uh, buildings and impressive, uh, inter internal to the buildings, impressive kind of digitalized security and responsive um, technology, but have no public infrastructure to find people without access to water or access to uh, basic needs, energy and so forth. Um, so the data and monopolies that we currently have make those make the option for, for governments to produce public data almost impossible. Um, Okay, I've gone on to my <laughs> next slide. I'm trying to keep up with the slide. And what a very clear area is that uh, big tech has taken over public health. Um, we can we know that health that our health services are increasingly privatized across countries. There's almost no country now where there's no element for, for uh, health. And in our in the both in the e-commerce rules, but in other provisions in the trade agreements, this turns them into a service that then is subject to the um, rules. I saw a question there saying, can't, can't some of these rules uh, have exceptions, have exceptions for things like public health? And that does appear, but it almost can never be in, uh, 
successfully use, utilised because governments have already allowed uh, big tech, but also big pharma and other health and other um, corporations to operate in these fields. And therefore it's a, a service that has been already financialized and is subject to the rules. And if you think about some of the tech technology that's in health um, that would need data to be collected and that is currently being financialized, you can imagine the risks associated with having rules that mean that government can't intervene. Some of those are, are clear, things like um, the, the actual technology that's collecting data from, uh, from our hospital services, whether that be ultrasounds that are now produced by Samsung, whether that be um, pacemakers that people have or medical imaging data, but it's also in things like uh, wearable sensors. Samsung, again, Samsung is one of the companies that's decided that their growth is actually in health, di digital health um, products, right? And they've invested billions in growing that sector along with others and created alliances with other big tech companies to make that happen. And one of those things is to, they would like to produce all the sensor data, whether that be your Fitbit or, or, or um, other parts of data that might go into phones or other, other services that might have employees wear them. And it can collect data from what is your temperature, you know, it can collect data about your blood pressure, as well as the kind of things people are familiar with and have that universally, uh, no matter which company is using the sensor, have that data mining as a single source of information that Samsung would hold. And you can imagine how valuable that is to them, how much, how they, how much they can financialize that level of data that might end up being you know, a large percentage of people across the, the globe's uh, daily health um, information. Uh, I think if, if I'll go uh, to the next slide. Okay. Yeah, Kate, you have to uh, tell us when we have to switch. Right. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. If you could go to the next slide. Sorry. Um, all right. Okay. So I just wanted to very quickly touch on the issues of um, tax avoidance that is another way that big tech is undermining our public services. So first of all, of course, and, and Deborah's touched on more of this earlier, that um, are, they are both a provider of public services, but they're also undermining the capacity of governments to regulate uh, public services or to compete with them actually in introducing the kind of, uh, or, or introduce a government-led data uh, provider, but also they are undermining our public services by denying uh, governments the, the revenue that they need. And they are notoriously some of the largest tax evaders, and you can see here that the amount that um, they have in tax havens. But the the rules, the both the rules in terms of the e-commerce chapter of the TPP or the proposed in the WTO, but also other provisions in the trade agreements make it even more difficult to pursue these big corporate big data corporations for their taxes one of course if they don't have a local presence then um, data companies are already familiar with choosing their jurisdictions most of them are registered in tax havens uh, whether that be delaware like amazon or um, in ireland as apple has done and those jurisdictions are increasingly also data havens. So there's a correlation between secrecy jurisdictions that allow you to hide your profits and those that where you would like to hold your data because it wouldn't be subject to the kind of uh, laws that perhaps Rwanda or other countries might be introducing. Um, and I think there is some responses to this. So Apple, the, the comment earlier that uh, the decision today, I think I've got the next slide, is about Apple. Um, there are some responses to this. I think Apple, of course, was taken, the EU pursued Apple for, the, for its $15 billion worth of 
tax evasion and today they've just the apple has won the appeal and this shows us actually that we need a different response i think if we shouldn't be disheartened by this loss because actually it shows that the eu is not currently able to pursue tax evaders and that we need an entire entirely different response one of which of course is that we can't have these trade agreements which protect them but also there's other responses like coming together with real multilateral cooperation and producing um, digital profits tax rules, uh, which should go ahead, I think, with some governments initially, and then hopefully pursuing them. I just put this here because I wanted to remind everybody of the fact that this is the leaked memo that during one of the leaks, I think um, might have been the Panama Papers, some of Apple's internal uh, memos were released. And you can see what these big companies are seeking. And this was a memo that went around to, uh, to, to law firms in different jurisdictions asking about whether that jurisdiction would be suitable when Apple had to move some of its holdings out of Ireland because of the changes to their tax rule. So first of all, of course, they're asking for um, whether, they will, whether they will be able to avoid tax importantly for them. Secondly, though, is will anything be public? Will they have to disclose anything about the company? And so the need for secrecy. And the third is, will the, is there any democracy and the need for it to, to be guaranteed that there will be not, no democracy, no opposition party, no potential for change of government? And so I think we can see from these the, 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 the nature of these companies seeking both secrecy and a lack of democracy. Um, I very briefly, I think we're going to touch on, but we can perhaps discuss it later. And Deborah's already touched on this. It's the next slide, and I won't go through it a lot. But I just did want to point out that um, there are solutions, and and I think it's been mentioned by other speakers as as data as a public good. In PSI, we've commissioned to pay some work on this, and it's down there. Um, the publication by Paminder Singh, to working with us on this idea that we can actually do. Uh, governance of data differently. I think right now is the time to do it because the pandemic is opening up opportunities to rethink the social contract. Um, and I think it's a, you know, it's an exciting concept that really we all have to get our heads around a complete shift in what we've been taught about property and about uh, the rights of corporations to financialize absolutely everything. But it would be both uh, a, an advance in um, Access, you know, in, in data industrialization has been mentioned and making the capacity of what data can actually do for us uh, much more broadly applied and in improving our public services. So I'll leave it there because I think I might have gone over, but um, thanks again. Thanks, Kate. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, once again, uh, to the participants, all the presentations you saw and the wonderful book of Deborah. Uh, all available on Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung Brussels webpage. We will copy the link again um, uh, in the chat. So now, unfortunately, because we are not as we are supposed to be in one room, but we are somewhere, um, I have to pick up uh, out of the many, many questions. Uh, and uh, there has been uh, to start. Obviously, it's uh, the honor is to Deborah. Uh, to start with uh, answering some questions. There are two questions, uh, Deborah, I would like to pose to you, uh, which came from the participants. First uh, question is uh, very uh, to the point. It's basically the question, what can Bangladesh do to restrict Amazon? And the second question is something which is so interesting for myself, I have to uh, admit. Uh, are there any models for collective and democratic ownership of data which already exist from regions, uh, technical models from some countries where we could look up? If uh, you could start with these two questions. Um, yeah, thanks, Deborah. Sure. Um, thank you so much uh, for the questions and thanks to everyone for your lively participation and to my co-panelists. Um, so in 
Response to the question about Bangladesh, I mean, I think that there are things that you can do. For example, the government could pass laws stating that all data that Amazon collects um, have to uh, be available to the national government, have to be available for local startups, have to um, stay within the country, for example. You could have uh, uh, local startups be supported um, to be competing uh, with Amazon. The issue is that you're never gonna have a small country be able to create a competitor to a first mover that's been involved, that's had the advantages of first mover status, that's been collecting big data from all over the world for a long time, that got um, tax subsidies by not being taxed for many, many years. Um, so you're, you're not really gonna be able to compete with Amazon so much, but there is a way to sort of hem them in and say, we wanna set these rules now so that Amazon is not able to exploit the local community as much. For example, they are increasing the amount of fees that they charge um, to um, uh, uh, companies that use their platform. Um, and you can have rules about that. Why couldn't you have rules uh, managing that? Why couldn't you have rules ma uh, mandating that they have to pay taxes? Okay. So these are, you know, things you can do, but again, those rules, anything you would be able to do as a, as a local uh, country or as a, as a small country would be constrained. Like the rules that we're talking about that we're explaining are intended to prevent you from being able to do that. Um, just really quickly on the good examples too, there are a few, um, I haven't studied it widely, but there are, uh, there is uh, the city of Barcelona. There's a lot of documentation about them using, uh, developing itself as a smart city, but for the benefit of uh, the public. Um, but I also like to turn this, this a little bit on its head because a lot of the investment in the technologies that we use today that has been privatized actually were invented with public money, okay? So if we think about the fact that the internet is an invention uh, under the auspices of the US military, okay? GPS was invented by the CIA. So a lot of these things, and we do it all the time in the US where we invest public money um, in creating new technologies, and then we allow the, the private sector to get all the benefits from it and even to charge the public sector exorbitant amounts, okay? So there's different ways um, uh, to look at that uh, in terms of, of, of trying to find some, some positive alternatives in order to uh, make sure that there's some public benefit. And I'll allow me, um, there was a couple of other questions I think that, that um, I just wanted to be able to touch on for a second. There's a lot about you know what's changed under COVID, okay? And so how are things different? And particularly with result uh, with regards to monopolization, there were several questions about that. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand how the rules interact with this really important issue of monopolization and um, competition policy. So now, nearly all digital trade now is dominated by a few global players from the United States and China. And this is really changing the way that commerce is done and it's reorganizing an economic activity and leading really to digital domination, okay? So governments around the world in North and South are really rethinking competition policy and investigating anti-competitive practices of the same corporations that are the inventors of the proposed digital trade rules, okay? So if we look at the fact that Google and Facebook have already faced steep fines from the EU, from the, uh, Germany, from France, from India, Australia are all investigating anti-competitive behavior and law breaking. I will tell you in the United States, we have unprecedented investigation from the House, from the Senate, from several regulatory agencies under Trump, and from states attorneys general looking into the um, monopolistic practices. Now what's happened under COVID is that it has dramatically expanded. So you've seen the big behemoth buying up local corporations. We just had Uber uh, buy a competitive um, food delivery service called Postmates. We see, as was mentioned, Microsoft trying to really um, elaborate its digital surveillance, including surveillance of workers. Uh, this is really burgeoning under as more and more people work at home. Um, and the bigger corporations just had more cash available to them because they're so profitable because of the rules that they are able to make bigger and bigger profits. And this gets back to the main issue then. If you look at the fact that the big tech corporations have vastly expanded their market power and their revenues and profits under COVID, okay, under the economic crisis. At the same time, you have Amazon workers striking to be allowed to wash their hands at work striking to be allowed to wear protective, personal protective equipment, you know, uh, having labor, I mean, the abominable labor conditions, 
That's not because those Amazon workers lack skills, okay? This is not a skills issue. And I, I really think it's important for us to stop falling into that trap, talk about that. We need to talk about the rules. The reason why Amazon has increased its market power and why the workers are being shafted under COVID is because the way the market is designed with the influence of those corporations to extract. And we need to push back against that. So, uh, you know, it, it's also, I mean, just think about the fact, monopolization wise, these digital trade proposals are extremely premature rulemaking, okay? We've had 2,000 years of agriculture in Europe, and, and, and Europe does not believe in free trade and agriculture, okay? We want regulated agriculture, okay? So why should we have, with a, in just a few years of digitalization coming on, suddenly a rush to say, oh, we need to have rules, we need to have rules. We need rules, but they're different. You know, we need a new economic agenda um, for... Um, for development of, of, of industries, as Rashmi pointed out, but we need uh, a new way of, of sort of governing um, these industries. So, you know, I, I just also, there was, uh, if you don't mind, uh, one last question I wanted to answer, and I, I wanna hear from my co-panelists on some of, the, some of the other really great questions, but there's really a lot, um, you know, aside from, we've talked a lot about the economic impacts today, okay? But there is a lot of safety and security impacts, and there's questions raised about this in terms of the fact that there are proposals in the digital trade negotiations for the corporations to extend their influence in domestic uh, regulatory processes, okay? So they actually want to encourage governments to avoid unnecessary regulation of electronic transactions. And so if you have a situation in which one country feels that a measure or a regulation of another country inhibited the first country's right, uh, the corporation of their country's right to make a profit, and they want to, um, uh, you know, to challenge that measure, the defending country would have to defend its measure as transparent, objective, reasonable, impartial, necessary, and legitimate to a trade tribunal, okay? And this, this type of uh, rules, exceptions, have been used, as was question about the exceptions, they've been used as successful only once in 44 times in the WTO. So this is not the way to go, okay? So we know, for example, that banning mandatory source flow disclosure would make us very unsafe. Uh, we need constant um, monitoring by regulatory agencies of the source algorithms that are increasingly making decisions in our lives in things like the internet of things, televisions, heart monitors. The corporations who make these do not invest enough um, in um, safety and security, cybersecurity, and they have, that's why we had so many hacking scandals over the many years. So this is really problematic. Um, and, and the last thing I'll just mention uh, on these issues from some of the questions was that the proposals are, are really also, they contain measures that would really make the platforms wholesale immunity of the platforms for the harm caused by their business operations. Now, what do I mean by that? Under US law, the largest corporations in the history of the world are shielded from liability from the harm that is caused by their business practices, okay? They are unaccountable to legal frameworks that apply to their counterparts, okay? This is obviously a competition issue as well. Now, Facebook, for example, is not legally obligated to remove libelous or false allegations from its news feed the way that traditional news media are, okay? Now, in recent years, to give an, a, a really incredible example, women, who are survivors of human trafficking have challenged the immunity of the platforms that they're being trafficked on for facilitating and making a profit off of their misery. But we have this law and it's called Section 230 in the United States. And it indemnifies for platforms what would have been illegal if it had occurred in print media, okay? This law is extremely controversial in the United States for various reasons, but the US advocates for the export of this law through digital trade rules. That's not about e-commerce, okay? That is about making sure that these corporations don't have to respect your privacy, don't have to respect the law, and continue to, you know, build their power and profit by exploiting workers. Uh, and, 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 you know, these issues are all for democratic debate. You know, they're not for just uh, having these trade rules written uh, behind our backs. So thank you uh, for all those questions. I'll stop there. Uh, incredible, uh, the last example. Um... Uh, thanks for this. Um, uh, Kamati, Rashmi, Kate, if, if you would like uh, to pick up uh, um, questions you have seen, uh, just please get inside. But before this, I have a question uh, I would like to extend to 
Kamati, there has been one question I would like to end a, a little bit. It was about the uh, automatization uh, with, let's say, artificial intelligence in the tea production in East Africa. Uh, at the very end of your uh, presentation, you mentioned uh, the danger, the challenge of losses uh, we might have to expect in the agriculture sector. And because this is such a fundamental question for humanity, I would like to ask you if you have some more thoughts about this, uh, what data economy uh, might mean for um, agricultural production, if you have to say something. Afterwards, please just, I open the floor. Thanks. Uh, do you want me to take the question first? The floor first? Okay. Uh, the question that was uh, put on the chat, I think it's a very interesting question. How can small countries uh, bargain with big uh, big digital giants like Amazon and also the question about the Bangladesh and Amazon? Right now, there is no law uh, or no um, digital rule which tells the countries that they cannot own their data, they cannot declare sovereign rights over their data. So the first step the countries need to do, whether they are small or big, is to declare sovereign rights over their data. Then Amazon cannot be an owner of your data. So if Amazon is doing something with your data, it has to take permission and it has to see what the national law is. Now, second, I have shared in the chat the link to the paper on South-South Digital Cooperation, which really looks into this issue of small countries if they do not have the capacity, what should be the way forward for them? It should be a regional digital cooperation. So if you cannot bargain alone with the digital giants, it should be a regional, uh, a regional uh, rule that prevails, or let's say the, the, within the region, there are certain set of rules uh, which are put in place so that each country does not have to negotiate separately with the big giants. And I also want to say, I know, we have very limited time, but I also want to say that in the WTO, developing countries are always defensive. We are looking at the rules that are being negotiated and we are saying that this is going to adversely impact us. Why can't we be more offensive? And why can't we say that small countries on their own cannot dictate terms with big digital giants? So let us have a multilateral uh, rule uh, to regulate uh, these big uh, digital companies, uh, there should be a, a multilateral rule that countries have to own their data and any uh, foreign firm that enters a, a country needs to share the data that the, the digital platform collects with the government and with, with the, uh, the other uh, firms. So this is the concept of data being a public good. Uh, I think these are the kind of rules that we need to govern the digital economy and not the rules that are currently being negotiated at the WTO. Thank you. Okay, Th um, thank you very much. Um, in terms of uh, the question posed to me on the T uh, production. Um, I think one of the best uh, case study for me has been Kenya, where they stopped the, you know, the large scale introduction of uh, tea plucking machines. But also this was due to the fact that uh, all the tea plantations in Kenya are organized under a very strong trade union. So there was a lot of uh, lobbying from the trade union. They went to court in terms of how that will uh, affect um, the country economically in terms of employment and the people that uh, have been employed. But in terms of just agricultural and, and, and digital trade, I think it's uh, the restructuring that is going on how it is going on, by whom, and our food is being produced and, and, and distributed, and how this is actually affecting or going to affect the small scale food uh, production system that we, we know exists, particularly from, from developing countries. But also just uh, uh, looking at the fact that the advance of big tech companies into agriculture and the wider food uh, system presents a number of challenges to those trying to make a living uh, and feed themselves from small scale uh, uh, agriculture. 
So this means that, you know, agri-tech business will continue to benefit most at the expense of, of small-scale pharma. And we are seeing this in terms of uh, uh, seed, seed production, in terms of, you know, a lot of research work in, 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 in seed technology and all that. It's, it's the big tech that have money to actually um, invest. Um, uh, uh, there was another question that was was directly posed to me in terms of uh, uh, civil society, and I think one of one of the uh, person who raised an, a question. I think it's Anil, and and the question has been answered by Dr. Rashid, Rashmin uh, in terms of you know the kind of you know weak governments that already exist. In, 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 in our, uh, most of the developing country to be able to effectively engage in such kind of, of, of negotiations. So the civil society uh, therefore presents uh, a pressure points and, and, and not just uh, pressure points in terms of just, you know, talking about it, but also offering alternative and I think uh, that's what Deborah is, is also doing. That's what we are doing uh, in, in, in the world is not for sale network in terms of offering alternative you know, proposals to the texts that are being negotiated. And also just pointing out to those negative uh, or negative texts that will affect us negatively and bringing them to book. Because you know, having worked so many years uh, with De Deborah and other civil society, sometimes the government officials will tell you, can you please uh, you know, give us an alternative to what is being proposed or can you tell us more about what you're talking about? So for me, I think civil society, we, we, is, is actually central to ensuring that uh, we, we, we are not, uh, we, we get the best out of, uh, out of this. So I, I think that's, that's just that. But also in terms of, sorry, in agriculture, I think one of, one of the proposals that the trade unions are putting on the table is the issue around just transition. And this also applies when it comes to, you know, digital trade, digitalization, e-commerce, the kind of loss of jobs that are going to happen. Can we have some kind of just transition um, in, in terms of, 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 of supporting the people that are going to, to, to lose their jobs? Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Kamati. Uh, uh, Kate, there has been one question I would like uh, especially to pose to you because I think it's it's kind of affecting directly uh, the public services. Uh, Ranja uh, posed the question, in the light of COVID-19, digital technology has got a massive push. Um, would you say this strengthens or weakens the case for regulating the digital corporations? So I read it in a sense, uh, COVID-19, change of the mm. rules of the games. Right. Um, well, I, yeah, I think that there's been obvious opportunities for big tech uh, during this time. And some of that is just, you know, increasing their monopolies and obviously they've been increasing their profits. But also, again, they have been contracted to, to deliver some of the tech services for governments. and pushed out um, public sector, including things like the COVID tracing app. Amazon was has been contracted to develop some of the tracing apps. Um, and that, well, for example, with the Australian government, Amazon won the contract. The contract is with Amazon registered in Delaware, which of course is a tax haven, and the, the data will be sh uh, stored offshore. So, a lot of the public is concerned about the individual privacy around that and of course that's an issue and people uh, have been I guess hesitant sometimes to use those apps because of that reason but very little discussion about the potential for Amazon um, to to uh, financialize the metadata that they are collecting that the government may have access to when there's an individual need to use the app 
but the overall metadata I think is something that that is not discussed um, and the need for for that kind of public health access and then of course the other element that I think that was asked is about the tax and we are in other in other crises in in history where there's been some companies profiting from a crisis like war there has been an excess profits tax and i think that that is something that we should also discuss now is that these are the companies that are profiting they're already evading tax and now is the time i think when we see that um they're not contributing Together with, but I also do think that this is the time that COVID does give, give us the chance to talk about new ways of governance. And because governments have had to step in the economy already and do things that are contrary to trade agreements, many governments have done things that breach rules and have had to do it and see that a crisis requires it, that it's the state that has to act to stop a crisis. Um, whether that be taking over private sector health, whether it be um, that they're trying to develop new manufacturing in their own countries of PPE and, and securing supply chains that really are trade rule breaches. They have seen that the rules that have been set up by corporations haven't, aren't going to keep us safe. So now is the time for us to be saying these rules don't work. We've got to rethink those rules and think of new ways of, of developing public goods that we need for our public health. And I think people are turning towards the state actually to say, how do we protect our public health in the future? And one way is our data, and that's very clear. So I think there's an opportunity for us there. And I think see other people mentioning the need for us all to come together, um, trade unions, civil society, experts to do that and, and create this push now for something different. Uh, thanks a lot, Kate. Uh, this would be possible to be a perfect last uh, words for for meeting absolutely brilliant uh, thanks a lot for that but as we are here because deborah has published uh, the book i would like to give uh, closing remarks to deborah unfortunately please believe me i would like to stay with you uh, longer here but we are all busy and we, we need to stop on time i'm already a little bit over time i apologize for this so please deborah last words before I close. Uh, well, thank you so much to everyone who's joined us. Thank you so much to the best of Rosa Luxemburg to Transform Europe for hosting us today. Um, I really appreciate the wealth of knowledge um, of my co-panelists and I hope that you all follow up with some of the uh, links that have been shared. I'm sorry we didn't get to the, all the questions, but if you write us, we will be happy to take those issues up and dialogue more with you further. Um, I just think, you know, we are in this unprecedented crisis right now and we have a lot of uncertainty and rapid transformation happening. We need our governments to be able to respond more proactively to emerging problems. And this touches on what Kate just mentioned about the fact that a lot of countries are looking at the trade uh, commitments that they've made in the past and saying, whoa, that needs to be changed. You know, we need to be able to source manufacturing closer to home of personal protective equipment. We need to break patent monopolies that the U.S. has on uh, medicines that have uh, enabled a gigantic transformation of wealth from the South to the North, from consumers to corporations over the last history of, of, of since the inception of, of TRIPS rules in the WTO. We need public interest concerns about economic rights, racial justice and fairness, human, civil and political rights to be the focus of conversations about rewriting the rules governing data and technology. Now, if we go in the way we are, there's no reason to think that technology is going to uh, uh, bridge the digital divide to, to, make, uh, to reduce inequality. Inequality has been graciously exacerbated, not just by digitalization, but the rules under which it has uh, developed. And technology corporations are seeking to make that permanent and accelerate that vast chasm of inequality happening within countries and between countries. They wanna make sure that that's a permanent system. So we have to be active in contesting their rulemaking. Now, as we mentioned, there are some agreements that already exist. So if your country is a member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you already have these rules. If you're you're part of USMCA, um, if you are EU with Japan, you already have them. But that doesn't mean that they have to be uh, exported to the whole world because they are much harder to change 
if they are agreed in the WTO. Between the EU and Japan, you can change it when you finally decide that it makes no sense for your countries. Um, but we need to not happen in the WTO, and we need your help and your participation. We need many, many more people to get involved in this. Uh, we're all seeing the ways that, that uh, the increasing monopolization, exploitation of workers, non-payment of taxes is, is just having super negative impacts on all of us as working people. And we need to make a change and we need to make sure that our activities that we're advocating for, if they're economic justice, racial justice, you know, data privacy, whatever, that they include also paying attention to the rules that are being developed globally. And we have uh, lots of room for growth within our world is not for sale for more groups to join to participate in this fight to get more active in pressuring their governments to say whoa this is a big tech thing here you know five years ago everybody thought that facebook was cool okay that's not the case anymore we want to put a stop to their their monopolization and exploitation of data their infringement on our democratic processes they're uh, you know messing up of our elections there's just so many problems so we see this now and we need to make a change and we need to get the rules that we need worker rights, more taxation, anti-monopoly, and stop them from implementing the rules that they want, which will really have such a devastating impact on our lives for the future. Because once you get these rules in the WTO, forget ever changing them. That is a problem. Thank you so much. I look forward to working with all of you on these issues. No need for me to add anything. Uh, just uh, to give my... Uh, greatest thank you to all the four speakers. Please, I recommend to all the participants read Deborah's books and also, uh, so last book, this book now, and please also uh, look at the Our World is Not for Sale uh, uh, webpage with excellent uh, uh, articles there. So yeah, we all have to join because all different sectors we are working in um, are confronted by this uh, attack on the rules. So whatever you are working in, if you're interested in climate, anti-racism, trade union rights, uh, you have to be a little bit an expert on trade and this book will help you. So uh, thanks a lot uh, to all of you. Uh, I hope to see you soon again in the real world. Uh, thanks a lot to Deborah, thanks to Kate, thanks to Rashmi. Thanks, thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for Alexandro, brought us here together. Okay, bye-bye.